Hey everybody, it's Cherry here, and today we're going to be playing some WWE 2K19 as I tell you the story of the time I became a professional wrestler, won every single belt in existence, became a billionaire, went on a really crazy DMT trip multiple times, turned into a bear, and then finally died in a horrific wrestling accident. Let's get to it. Now, the first thing I had to do was choose whether I wanted to be a roided up meathead, a roided up meathead, or a roided up meathead. Finally, I settled on a roided it up meathead. Then, like the responsibility a new parent is given upon the birth of their child, I too was given a great responsibility. I had to turn this munted Play-Doh man into a world champion. I set my first name to Agent 47, my surname to Hitman, my social media handle to Real Hitman, and my stage name to the assassin Beautiful Alpha Bacon, because that was clearly the only suitable name for a natural-born killer like me. I then set my hometown to Chad, and got ready to choose which of these knobs was going to serve as the canvas for the masterpiece that was soon to be breathed into existence. Finally, I settled on this bozo and gave him the super pasty skin color of a man that's never left his mother's basement. I then gave him a couple of beautiful bright blue eyes and made myself the maximum weight of 320 pounds, which I think is roughly about 150 kilos. I then shrunk myself down to five foot six and then went to Thailand to spend whatever little money I had in my savings account on liposuction so I'd look jacked when I got on stage in my undies. And then it was time. Time to crack out the old hammer and chisel and turn this catastrophic car accident of a human being into the most handsome, desirable, and swole person ever to walk God's green earth. And then gave the old facial features a bit of a tweak to make my wrestler look perpetually amused and confused at the same time. I then went to the gym for 23 hours a day to beef up every single part of my entire body. Especially the cake. I was then ready for the most important part of the transformation the body oil. All of the body oil. Then, then, despite there being an option to just take a ready-made suit and slap it on my character, I lovingly made one by hand using permanent tattoo ink because I am an idiot. <laughs> and I like to do things to make my life difficult and miserable. After that, I slapped the old barcode on the back of my head so if I ever get lost, people would be able to find out which aisle of the supermarket I came from. And I made myself a pair of super sick undies to wear in the ring on top of my suit pants. I then lit my nuts on fire and I was almost ready to go. The last stage in the production process was setting the pose that I'd assume in every piece of promotional material I appeared in moving forward in my professional wrestling career. Obviously, this was what I chose. And so it all began, with me, homeless and not a cent to my name, living out the back of a crusty old bug extermination van. This is, in essence, a rags to riches story. Kind of. Because when you're already right at the bottom, the only way to go is up. Also, that's what I thought before I recorded this... <laughs> video. I'd actually managed to schedule my very first wrestling match in the amateur circuit at a crappy old backyard promotion called BCW. Literally nobody had ever heard of it, and we had no marketing budget, so I had to go around the country sticking these flyers anywhere I could in the hopes that someone would attend. Everywhere I went, people would either tell me I look like a nightmare version of Joe Rogan that you saw when you took a little bit too much DMT, or they'd bully me and tell me I look like a ginormous oily ding-dong. Even this lovely interracial couple told me that they hoped I'd break my neck in the ring and to get the stupid look off my face. Sadly, I couldn't. Because this is my... <laughs> This is my face. The very next morning, after a great sleep in my van, I put on about 50 liters of body oil and got ready to go and make a name for myself and a billion dollars along the way. My first business meeting was obviously in a soup kitchen, and for some reason, I couldn't help but feel like I was either really, really, really small for a 320 pound adult male, or these guys were just really, really big. I also couldn't figure out why nobody else was covered in body oil. This idiot, who you'll see multiple times throughout this video, was my first opponent and my best friend. His name is Cole, and he is a piece of garbage. My favorite move is grabbing his ears and watching him flail around helplessly on the floor like the piece of trash he is. The audience loves it. Anyway, that night, scouts from the WWE were actually in the audience, so I had to put on a bit of a show and stepped on Cole's face repeatedly, then boofed him in the head till he passed out. The giant men who 
forgot to put on their body oil congratulated me on my dominant victory and invited me to Hooters for dinner to celebrate. Then approximately one week later, the WWE was so impressed that they called me up and invited me in for an exhibition match with a delightful cross-eyed fellow called bone a strong man or something he was a man of few words and many steroids i'm actually your opponent tonight you mean victim so how do you want to die tonight uh -huh. we're gonna do what i want to do great idea uh... and before i knew it it was time time for my first match on the big stage wwe raw baby making his from Chad, weighing in at 320 pounds, the assassin, beautiful Alpha Bacon. The bell rang, the fight started, and I honestly couldn't tell you what happened after that. All I remember is lying on my back with my legs behind my head and a ginormous cross-eyed bikey laying on top of me whispering, Take it like a man. <laughs> Take it like a man. <laughs> Whatever did happen in those very brief 10 seconds, though, left Mr. Bone a strong man clearly exhausted. Backstage, my agent scanned my barcode repeatedly and told me that I was an absolutely worthless piece of shit. And then, like something out of a dream, it happened. Hey, I saw a lot of positive things from you tonight. So with that being said, We'd like to offer you an NXT contract. Which was totally hilarious. But anyway, I was now a primetime big deal WWE superstar in the making. So I did what any other WWE superstar in the making would do and went to hang around in a dark alleyway at night so I could post an Instagram story. Well, the audience is saying that I'm good enough to go straight to the main roster, which actually I think I proved it tonight by going toe to toe with Braun Strowman. And then got sucker punched in the back of the head by a goldfish in a leather jacket. The video went viral and everyone at the WWE was extremely disappointed with me for being such a beta. Look, the fan attacked me first. I was just defending myself. I'm not gonna lie, at that moment I felt so small. I'm not sure if it's because I'm an absolute failure or because I actually am small and I was surrounded by three men that completely dwarf me in size three times over. But they all gave me that I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed look, then tore up my contract and kicked me in the nads repeatedly. The next day, my agent told me that he was never going to give me up, never going to let me down, never going to run around or desert me, and to get my ass out of my van and return to the amateur circuit to beat up my idiot friend Cole for the 47th time. Cole, however, was no longer the same man whose ass I beat a few days prior. Now he had a magic black mask, which when he put on mid-fight, instantly channeled the power of 500 gimps. <laughs> throwing me through the windshield of my own van and humiliating me in front of all the other homeless people watching the fight. Beat up, humiliated, and disillusioned, the only thing that made sense at this point was to go to Mexico. As soon as I arrived, I got into a fight with an eggplant man who I bashed up real good and then scheduled an appointment to arrange a 500 kilogram shipment of crack cocaine as to be delivered to my van every single day until it finally killed me. And I tell you, it must have been some good stuff because the next thing I remember, I was in Japan beating up my buddy Cole again, but this time inside of a steel cage. And then the next thing I remember after that, we were both at NXT tag teaming some dude in front of thousands of people. Like I said, lots of crack cocaine and all that, but I think, I think he might have only had one leg. The following week, Cole, my agent, and myself all got together in the car park to decide what outfits we'd wear to our next NXT invasion. Obviously, we decided on 80s wrestling superstars. Cole looked pretty dope, and I did the best I could digging around inside of one of those Salvation Army clothing bins, rocking up as the ultimate warrior and the macho man Randy Savage. And then the bouncers rocked up and beat the crap out of the both of us. To add insult to injury, Triple H then brought out the same goldfish man that jumped me in the dark alley on that fateful night that signaled the termination of my NXT contract the very same day it began. Then, after flipping him into the ring and possibly severing his spinal cord, spinal. my worst nightmare became my reality. The goldfish man was my agent and maybe my father. I don't know. I went to smash his face in, but then realized that I didn't have any gloves on and that such actions were highly uncivilized and possibly unhygienic. 
so I let him live. After that, Triple H met me backstage to tell me that I was a little wussy man and to ask why I was always so oily. And then some big hairy Indian bloke randomly appeared out of nowhere and started beating the flippin' crap out of me. So I smashed a giant trash can over his head a couple of times and then power bombed him through a table. He's dead now. And then with that business taken care of, I casually strolled down into the arena to join the other half-naked men in the ring. Oh, <laughs> okay, I guess he's not actually dead. Either way, I dominated the ring in true Alpha Bacon fashion and won the elimination match, bringing me one step closer to winning all of the belts. It was also at this point that I realized I was in the WWE, though I honestly don't remember ever signing a contract, which was kind of weird, but whatever. My performance actually seemed to impress one of the patients from the local brain trauma hospital who came all the way down to show me that he'd finally learn how to clap. Then as he got closer, I soon realized that he wasn't actually a brain dead victim of a parachute accident, but the USA champion of USA, <laughs> USA or something. Then he got all up in my face and despite my best attempts to warn him that if he didn't back off, he'd find himself naked on his back with me on top smashing him repeatedly, he didn't listen. He just, he just didn't. I was now officially the United States Champion of U USA and probably the American of the Year or something. As soon as I got backstage, some ginormous woman invited me to meet her for drinks, which was equal parts exciting and terrifying, <laughs> given the sheer magnitude of her head. And now that I was finally a big deal and filthy rich, I decided to treat myself to the revolting full-body roid abuse of vascularity package that I had my heart set on since I first put my underpants on on top of my suit and stepped into the ring. <laughs> it was gross. And then went out to speak to my fans in a suit that was almost identical to the one I was wearing underneath, but not quite. Which was just what Triple H was looking for to come out and to tell me that if I was genuinely dumb enough to wear a suit on top of another suit, I could at least wear one that matched, like the one he was wearing. He then told me that he was my mother and that he hated me and that I was an accident. Nevertheless, I am a professional and as such, I still went to work moments later after finding out that Triple H had been my mother all along. I then bashed everyone satisfactorily and defended my belt like an absolute champ because I was an absolute champ. When I got backstage, some weird hairy guy offered me a briefcase full of money for my belt, but I told him that unless that case was full of crack cocainus, I wasn't interested. Then I headed back to the ring for the seventh time that day to defend my belt against these two idiots. And I mean, things were going pretty well until some sneaky bugger that wasn't even part of the match slipped into the ring while the referee was preoccupied, broke my neck, Spinal. and lost me the match and my belt. Now, this really has nothing to do with anything, but watching this guy spaz out with absolutely no background music <laughs> is so trippy that I thought you guys should experience it just as I did. Anyway, later that night while I was smashing some dude in the ring, an even bigger dude suddenly appeared out of nowhere with a microphone in his hand. But honestly, I couldn't even see him until he was right in front of me. I'm here because I've heard all the buzz. You see, I've been around for a while. So I'm out here tonight because I want to know, do you measure up, Buzz? The next belt on my radar was the white one that was held by some douchebag and his three mums. I thought that if I rolled up on the mid-speech gangster style, I'd be able to bash him and take the belt for myself. Unfortunately, I seemed to have ever so slightly miscalculated my abilities and ended up getting bashed instead. I then woke up backstage, confused with some smelly man's crotch on my face. It was at that very moment that I was approached by another man who, just like me, looked like a ginormous ding-dong in a suit and was offered the opportunity to create my own belt and title in an attempt to lure the dude with three mums into a title match where I could rob him of his belt to add to my collection. I employed the services of world-class designers like Versace, Takashi69, and Mike Tyson, and this is what we came up with. The big PP of the world belt for the title of... We both handed our belts to the referee to hold as he looked like a relatively trustworthy fellow. And then I beat the living poopy McPoop nuggets out of the dumbass that I was in the cage with. It was really great and I loved every minute of it. The referee then unlocked the cage and I very casually climbed out while my opponent just stared at me, clearly struggling to decide whether he wanted to walk to the left or to the right or to just bleed to death from the ginormous head wound he was dealing with. And just like that, I was now the champion of even more stuff. 
Matter of fact, I think at this point there was only one belt left for me to lay claim to. The red one. I was such a big deal now that everywhere I went, people were stopping me to ask for selfies of me and my really <laughs> cool belt that I made. Everyone really, really seemed to love it. Now, what happened next was pretty weird. Some strange, grotty-looking dude with dreadlocks, terrible tattoos, and a stupid octopus singlet appeared on the screen and started saying a bunch of crap, then used the projector to put a bunch of maggots on the ring floor under my feet. I knew that if I ever wanted to beat that weirdo, I need to go and speak to the other weirdo backstage, because he was magic or something. Are you... Woken. If one is not woken, then there is no hope in combating a force such as the monster you speak of. And even I, who is supremely woken, have lost many battles to him in the Great War. I still, to this very day, have absolutely no idea what the heck he was talking about. But next minute, I found myself in some kind of nightmare with a sledgehammer wielding undead Triple H wearing a crown trying to kill me. It was all good though, I was totally smashing his ass. But then suddenly, Goldfish Man appeared behind me with a baseball bat and hit me in the Abdullah Boblongata. Unconscious on the floor, but with my eyes wide open, I was dragged into the darkness. It didn't take long before I was awakened by the same grubby freak that projected maggots all over the floor in the ring, who then proceeded to try and force me to hook up with his mum. Feeling completely disrespected by being brought here outside of business hours, I gave him a Walmart sure you can, and then covered his mum's house in gasoline and set the whole thing on fire with absolutely no regard whatsoever for whether or not he burnt along with it. When I got back, I was told that I did a great service to the local community as the house was apparently chock block full of asbestos. And the weird mage guy told me to eat some sus mushroom that would apparently unlock my final form. So I did, and before I knew it, I was in the multiverse. In order to unlock my hidden inner potential, I had to choose which of these four creatures was going to be my spirit animal. Was it a polar bear, a shark, a snake, or a used tampon? I knew immediately without hesitation that the polar bear was my spirit animal. And so I returned to Earth from my DMT trip dressed in a dead bear's head with a bunch of sheepskin on my bollocks, ready to crush creepy maggot guy in real life. Honestly, I don't know how or why my buddy Cole was suddenly in the ring with us, but hey, there he was. And then to celebrate our victory, we did this thing, which I still don't understand, but are made to feel extremely uncomfortable by. Ugh. Then suddenly out of nowhere, the DMT seemed to kick in again, and for a split second, I could swear to you that I was in the ring trying to pull Bret Hart's ears off his head. Then when I finally returned to planet Earth, I headed back to the ring for a six-man elimination match with everyone that I hated. Now, to be entirely honest, it didn't start off the best, but once my mojo kicked in, I was unstoppable. I was freaking fools left, right, and center. Boom, 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 bang, 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 bang all day long. And just like that, the red belt too was now mine. Triple H didn't look that happy though. Matter of fact, he was apparently so unhappy that he brought two goons to the ring with him and before I knew it, they'd both hopped in and while I did my best to fend them off, I got my neck broken again by the same dude that already broke it a few days earlier. Spinal. And because I was so mad, I actually went backstage to bash the security guards to let off a little bit of steam. And that's when I found Triple H laying on the floor in his underpants, licking the ground while he tweaked like a madman. So I slapped him. But then the Royd bros showed up again and the three of them bashed me for the second time and threw me into the limousine. Then Triple H, clearly an expert in insurance fraud, went and jammed a brick on the gas pedal and caused the limo with me inside to crash right into the WWE tour bus. And ironically, directly into my own face. Unsettled by this turn of events, I went to the audience to tell them that Triple H had been trying to kill me and that if anything were to happen, they were to contact the FBI immediately and ask to speak to Chief Inspector Ali G, who would most certainly discover the events that led to my demise. I Then like magic, my clothes instantly disappeared off my body in the crowd and the two strange dudes in the ring with me went wild as they all cheered and applauded my beautiful oily half-naked body. But it seemed that I was just too trusting and before I knew and I was getting kicked in the bollocks and got my neck broken for the third time. Spinal. You see, the hairy chess guy traded his case full of money for the chance to challenge me for all of my titles. And because I was dead, 
I wasn't able to defend my belts as well as I usually would have if I was alive. So I lost them all. Thanks for watching this stupid, stupid video. Goodbye.